Much of our semester is going to be spent talking about bacteria and to some extent viruses, and rightfully so, as they are kind of the exciting parts of microbiology. Um, module 3, however, gives us a little survey of uh, the other microbes that are out there, some of the eukaryotic microbes and some of the things that they do um, as well, and some of them produce some very significant disease. Okay, uh, so we'll start a little bit by talking about bacteria, just a little bit, and then we'll focus on some of the other microbes. All right, let's talk a little bit about prokaryotes and some of the things that they do, right? Because they're so vitally important to us. Um, you know, I mean, we say this all the time. Prokaryotes are everywhere. Yeah. You know, they can do almost anything. Literally, they can eat so many different food things, uh, things that are really weird to us. You know, they can eat uh, crude oil. They can eat pretty much any carbohydrate that's out there. They can live off uh, radiation and things like that. They can live in the weirdest places. Uh, and really, there is no life without prokaryotes. You know, we always talk about how plants are so vitally important. And of course, plants are important, right? But uh, prokaryotes produce more oxygen than plants. Um, yeah, fuck. Prokaryotes can produce more oxygen than plants. They produce all usable forms of nitrogen. Like literally, all forms of nitrogen are dependent on microbes, uh, on prokaryotes. Um, they're important for nutrient cycles. So whenever things die, whenever things need to get recycled, it's prokaryotes that play a vital role for that, right? And even for us, you know, they help us digest our food. They provide nutrition for us, all this kind of stuff. Metabolically diverse, right? So we can do so many interesting things with them, such as clean up the environment. And, uh, you know, we call this they're genetically moldable, right? So we can, we can employ them to do so many interesting things for us, including make our medications. Um, talk just a little bit about the nitrogen fixers. I did say that they produce all types of uh, usable forms of nitrogen, and that's due to these guys right here, these um, nitrogen... How come this is not working? Oops, I got to turn it on. Due to the uh, nitrogen-fixing bacteria, right? And uh, maybe some of the most famous are the rhizobium. Notice, by the way, it's capitalized, right, and italicized. That means this is a genus, right? But there are a group of bacteria we call the rhizobia, right, um, of which rhizobium is uh, a genus, right? So in that case, rhizobia would not be italicized. Anyway, so they live in the root nodules of uh, legumes, such as clover, right? And uh, what they do is they have this, this relationship, and we'll talk about uh, how we can define this relationship, where they help convert this nitri atmospheric nitrogen, which is like 80% of our uh, air, right? But not usable for life, right? But they can take that and convert that to ammonia. And then the ammonia now is what we call organic nitrogen. And this function, this fixing of nitrogen, we'll talk about what fixing means later this semester, but this fixing of nitrogen is a vital function for all life, right? So we are 100% dependent on this group, the nitrogen fixing bacteria to produce um, our ammonium for us. Life requires this. Um, of course, you know, prokaryotes, and we're going to talk about this a lot, the pathogen, right? Uh, the disease-causing organism. Remember, less than 1% are human pathogens, right? But because they have these huge human impacts, you know, they're much of the focus of our semester and much of the focus that uh, the general public has towards the microbes. You know, they don't care about the ones that are recycling elements for us. They don't care about the things that produce therapeutics and things like that, really what they care about are the ones that cause disease, right? And rightfully so, you know, of course, getting sick sucks, right? We've all been sick before, so that that's not a good thing, right? But then, you know, the impacts on, um, on uh, you know, the financial impacts that we have, just the general in impacts on our infrastructure, it has this huge effect, right? And so that's, of course, why much of our study of microbes really is geared towards uh, preventing, treating disease and things like that, right? And then they do other things like food spoilage, right? And believe it or not, they do cause disease and other things that are not humans, things like plants and animals, and all of these things combined to have like a major impact on humans. So when we talk about microbes and their relationship with its host, right, we can define them based on these, uh, um, these types of interactions, right, depending on uh, really who benefits, who is harmed, the nature of this relationship, right? So the, um, 
The term symbiosis simply means interacting or interaction, sorry, between species in a community. It can be one and one. It can be group and group, right? So really, that that's all this is. You know, in many ways, symbiosis simply means living together, right? And uh, you know, we'll often use, oh, these two have a symbiotic relationship, right? But you know, the term symbiotic relationship is actually kind of um, kind of vague, right? Because you know, you and your roommate, you guys have a symbiotic relationship, right? Because you guys live together, you and your family members, uh, and things like that, right? Um, so what you want to do is you want to define who or what happens to each of the populations uh, in this relationship, right? And of course, the best type of symbiotic relationship is something called mutualism. And in mutualism, uh, we'll just say population A and B, right? Both populations benefit. So they both get gain from this, right? So let's go back to this whole nitrogen-fixing bacteria. I said they're found in the roots of uh, legumes, right? Things like peas, beans, clover, things like that, right? That's what we call a mutualistic relationship because the bacterium, remember, produces um, this nitrogen for the plant, right? And because uh, it's intimately growing in the roots of the plant, like literally in the roots of the plant, um, the plant gains this immediate nitrogen, which is a, such a limiting factor in soil, right? But at the same time, the bacterium is protected, right? The plants kind of, uh, the roots kind of wrap around the, the bacterium, right? And then it gets like all this runoff of carbohydrates being produced by the plant uh, and then this protection from predators and things like that, right? So it's this really beneficial relationship for both organisms, right? So this is what we call uh, mutualism. Uh, in amensalism, uh, one population is harmed, the other is unaffected, right? It's kind of like a pathogenic relationship in which the, uh, you know, uh, the organism causes like an effect on, um, uh, on its host, right? So, you know, the host is harmed, right? But it's a little different in that um, in, uh, the uh, pathogen in this case would not really gain anything from it. It just kind of happens to cause disease. A good example of this is uh, like a plant plant relationship, right? Whereas you have this one plant that's growing, uh, and then its leaf causes a shade to cover another plant, right? And then that plant would be affected or be really harmed by that because it doesn't have access to the sun, right? Um, the first plant isn't gaining anything from this, right? It's just doing what it does, right? But it's harming a second plant. Uh, a microbial example would be this uh, microbial production of antibiotics, right? And there are many molds that can produce antibiotics. Um, the antibiotics end up killing or harming the bacterial population around that. But for the most part, the fungus doesn't gain anything directly from that, right? It's this sort of uh, indirect benefit in that it's uh, kind of killing off its competition, right? But it really truly doesn't gain from this uh, relationship. In commensalism, you have this relationship where uh, one microbe benefits, the other one is unaffected, right? And many of our microbes that live on us are what we call commensal. They hang out there, they kind of do their thing. Um, you know, they gain the protection from us, you know, especially if they're inside us. Uh, but, um, you know, we don't necessarily uh, benefit from them being there. They're just kind of there, right? But they, in turn, you know, they because they're inside, you know, it's always warm. They got these really good... Um, nice environment and access to some of the food sources that are present inside, right? So, you know, they just kind of hang out there. We like them being there, right? They're kind of important to us, right? But in general, there's nothing specific that they do that helps us out. Um, in many ways, we could consider some of these as well to be neutral, neutralism, where really there's really no benefit either way, right? Uh, you know, the ones maybe on our skin, they're just there, right? Um, they're not really doing anything for us, right? They're not really harming us. We don't really notice that they're there. You know, so there's this meh type of relationship, right? Where, um, you know, we don't really care, right? And so that's this whole idea of neutralism. And then, of course, in parasitism, you know, the worst kind is where uh, one organism benefits. In this case, the pathogen would benefit, uh, whereas the other organism is harmed, okay? So, uh, again, symbiotic relationships, a lot more complex than we make it out to be, right? Um living together, right? But really, there's going to be an effect on each type of population. Collectively, when we talk about microbes associated with a, within or around a larger organism, we call that a microbiome, right? This whole pop or ecology of microbes that surround this larger organism, right? And we have this intimate relationship with our microbiome. And then um, 
we can have these uh, resident uh, microbiome, uh, sorry, microbes that are living there permanently and then transient, which are kind of temporarily there, right? And then things like diet, age, and all this kind of stuff can change the constituency over time, including the resident ones. You know, we're going to be born with certain uh, microbes, and especially within our gut, and within our skin, and over time, that can change, right? But, you know, we kind of define the resident ones as being there for a relatively long time, um, you know, months, years, that kind of stuff, whereas transients are just sort of temporary passerbys, just kind of on the order of weeks. Okay, so that's enough for uh, bacteria for now. We're going to get back and talk about bacteria plenty, right? Uh, let's talk about um, some of the other types of microbes, and we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about our eukaryotic microbes, right? And we're going to start off with uh, the protists. Just quick review. Remember, protists are eukaryotic microbes. You know, as a group, they're extremely diverse. Um, so many different morphologies, so many different life cycles, nutritional needs. They're really hard to define. You know, oftentimes they're kind of like this miscellaneous group of microbes that really didn't classify well anywhere. Uh, most are free living and benign. They just kind of do their thing. They're part of the food cycle. You know, they eat bacteria for a living and then they themselves get eaten by larger organisms, right? So they're very important in the ecology. Uh, but of course, some are human pathogens, right? And probably um, the most important protozoan human pathogen is uh, plasmodium, which causes malaria. And malaria is this important worldwide disease. You know, we don't think about it too much because of the fact that, you know, we don't have uh, incidents of malaria around here. But malaria is quite important worldwide. Uh, giardia as well is causes um, some intestinal stuff, right? So, uh, you know, there are many protozoan parasites that we will talk about. You know, as a group, protists are not a true phylogenetic group. Remember, phylogeny means that uh, groups that share a common evolutionary origin, right? So the protozoans, or sorry, the protists, uh, they don't really share an evolutionary origin. In fact, we have these animal-like protists, these plant-like protists, the fungus-like protists, right? And But because they're all single-celled, mostly, they're all um, kind of doing what they do, and they don't really fit in the animal or in the plant, right? They say, you know what, let's just have this one large group called the protists, and we'll chuck them in there, right? Um, so often within protists, we'll refer to these as these kind of sub uh, Category, categorizations, right? And these would be more phylogeny. So our protozoa would be our animal-like um, protists, right? They're unicellular, they're motile, like little animals. Um, algae would be our plant-like protists. Uh, our slime molds and water molds are fungus-like, right? And just like their larger, uh, larger cousins, more complex cousins, they do very similar things, right? So our animal-like ones, our protozoa, they move, they eat, they poop. They sense and respond to environments just like animals do. Um, the algae, they're photosynthetic. Some of them are unicellular. Some of them are multicellular, right? But they are photosynthetic, which, of course, is one of the key features of uh, the plants. Uh, our fungi, slime molds, and water molds, you know, they're decomposers, right? So, again, very important part of the food chain. <clears throat> um and then mostly unicellular, right? But there are some uh, there are some multicellular slime molds and water molds. Uh, often we refer to these as plankton, right? So the protozoa can often be called zooplankton, algae are phytoplankton, and typically we use this term when they are in some sort of aqueous, uh, usually marine environments, right? So often you'll hear these things: zooplankton, phytoplankton. It just means the same thing. Uh, protists, when we're talking about um, especially the pathogenic ones, have very complex life cycles, right? And because they have this interplay between hosts, um, and then each protozoan uh, parasite, uh, each protista has its own very complex life cycle, right? But we're going to talk just um, very specifically about uh, um, some of the, the pathogens. Now, within this life cycle, it undergoes many changes in form and shape, right? So there's a couple of things I want us to kind of know the trophozoite is our feeding and growing stage of the life cycle, right? So when, whenever you talk about the trophozoite, you're talking about the, the form that's like actively growing, actively dividing. The cyst is um, a cell with a protective coat, right? In many ways, you can think of this um, kind of like an endospore, uh, maybe more like a seed, right? So, you know, it's uh, really depends on how you want to define this thing, what's going on, right? So let's call this like kind of like a seed, uh, which is, you know, for reproduction, kind of like an endospore, not really reproduction, but, you know, sort of this whole protective 
code, right? Um, that then allows it to serve five passage. And we'll talk about some uh, some protozoan parasites where the cyst stage is quite important. Uh, occasionally, you'll re see this referred to as an oocyst, right? Which is kind of like an egg cyst, right? A cyst uh, around the egg form, right? Then you know, for us, we're gonna keep it simple. We're just gonna say an oocyst and a cyst are more or less the same thing. Um, you'll hear the terms encystment, right, which is the formation of the cyst, and the excystment, which is a release from the cyst, right? Um, and many protozoans or many of these parasites are capable of both sexual and asexual reproduction, which is very important in the life cycle right, because uh, asexual reproduction is fast and easy. It right? really allows the parasite to get its numbers up really quickly, right? whereas sexual reproduction is important for things like uh, genetic diversity. You need to have a diverse a gene pool to really survive. Okay, so rather than uh, talk about um, like general things, you know, we'll kind of use some of the uh, just some examples of uh, protozoan parasites as a way to uh, kind of highlight some of the things that protozoans do. Right. So here we're going to talk about um, Imeria, which is a genus of um, an organism, a protozoan that causes a disease called coccidiosis. Now, uh, Imeria can cause disease in animals, cattle, dogs, cats, humans, things like that. And, um, you know, this one here is highlighted because of its um, uh, prominent cyst stage, right? So it has a cyst stage that's uh, it's necessary for it to cause this disease, right? Uh, but unlike some of the other organisms that we're going to see later, it's a one single host, right? And it's usually a specific host. So the specific species of Imeria will really only be able to infect uh, its preferred host. Um, let's see. So it begins with uh, when um, the cyst here, in this case it's an oocyst, is swallowed by the gut, uh, swallowed, right, and enters via uh, um, some sort of ingestion. Um, and it's this oocyst, right? Remember the cyst that's uh, protected, right? And here is this what we call the environment area, right? So here it's got to spend time outside. Uh, it requires a lot of time for this stuff to happen, right? It's cold outside, not a lot of food, right? So the cyst allows it to survive this passage while it's just kind of hanging out, waiting for the animal to come by, right? And then when the animal ultimately ingests it, it causes this disease, right? It's... Uh, Specifically things like it's intestinal, so things like diarrhea, dehydration, uh, when it gets really bad, weight loss and death, right? Uh, and in, in the meantime, it's undergoing, and notice the trophozoite here, it's growing actively, right, and doing its asexual reproduction. It's really just uh, growing real fast, uh, increasing its numbers, and then at some point, as it's uh, kind of reached its peak, it then goes and develops this cyst form, right? So it undergoes encystment as it does its sexual reproduction. Right, and then once it's formed its cyst, then it gets shed out in the feces, right? And then once again, it's a cyst that's so important. Now that it's done with this host, it needs to spread to the next, right? So the cyst stage is very important in Imeria being able to uh, pass from one to the next host, right? Uh, Nigleria, um, it causes a disease called primary amoebic encephalitis, right? And the word encephalitis simply means it's a swelling of the brain, Right, it's uh, often known as brain-eating amoeba, um, and we I like this one here because of this really interesting thing that it does. Right, it does this amoeboid movement. Actually, it just kind of lives there. Like Glaria is uh, what we would consider a, to be quite a poor pathogen. It doesn't really do things very well. It doesn't really. I mean, you could be uh, surrounded by it. It really doesn't um, affect you too much, right? But if for some reason it gets in through your nose, and usually it's not even just in your nose, usually it's like way up in your nose, right? It then uses its amoeboid movement, right? these pseudopods or pseudo feet, which just kind of walks and crawls, right? And makes its way to your brain and then starts to destroy neurons, right? And uh, it's extremely uh, deadly if you ever uh, catch this, right? This brain eating, uh, eating amoeba because there's no real treatment for it, right? It's... um. It's hard to treat. It's up in the brain, right? It's uh, you can't just like open up your brain and cut it out, right? So it's a, uh, it's quite a deadly disease, right? But typically, you only get it in uh, when you're playing in warm, fresh waters, right? And you know the most common way to get this, it's like water skiing. So you're out there water skiing, and then like you, you fall and you eat it, right? And then it happens to like just jam this thing way up in your, in your nasal cavity, kind of puts it near its brain, and then it lets it do a thing. 
extremely rare disease, right? But, uh, you know, the, um, again, very deadly if ever contracted. Uh, trypanosoma causes this thing called sleeping sickness. Very common in Africa, right? African sleeping sickness, right? And uh, the African version um, uses the tsetse fly as its, uh, as its vector, we call it, right? The vector is what uh, spreads this disease from one host to the next, right? Now, the thing about the vector is it's actually a host, right? So trypanosoma is a really good example of an organism that uses two hosts, right? Both the humans and the tsetse fly. Right, and it's this uh, tsetse fly that through the bites then transmits um, the trypanosoma pathogen, right? Um, let's see, initially uh, it takes a blood meal, right? It bites uh, the human and then it then multiplies, uh, does its asexual reproduction in the host, attacks the lymph nodes, right? Typically you get these swollen lymph nodes. That's kind of characteristic of uh, sleeping sickness. Um, and then this... Uh, uh, fever, pains, and then this mass itching, usually around the site of the bite, right? But as it starts to infect the nervous system, uh, you get this really weird disruption of your uh, sleep cycle, right? And so that's where the name sleeping sickness comes from. Just this really weird disruption of your sleep cycle. Sometimes you can't sleep. Sometimes you just sleep for way too long. And you get this really weird confusion. And then again, if it gets really bad, weakness and death, right? Um, now the trypanosoma doesn't want to stay in the human. It needs to complete its life cycle, right? So in order to do that, uh, it waits for another CC fly to come and then bite this infected human. And then it can migrate to the CC fly. And in the CC fly, then it undergoes its uh, sexual reproduction, right? And does its thing. And again, waiting around in the salivary glands until the next human gets bitten, right? And it's this interplay between the two hosts where it has to go. Humans cannot pass on trypanosoma to other humans. Uh, tsetse flies cannot pass it on to uh, other tsetse flies, right? So this interplay, and this is this whole really complex life cycle that we were talking about. So those three kind of uh, highlight some of the things that some of the protozoan parasites can do. Um, there are a lot of interesting protozoan diseases, but there's just not enough time to talk about them all, right? You know, just to go through a list of all the diseases. So here's kind of a list, you know, for those of you guys, um, you know, are interested in some of these um, this diseases for your uh, disease profile um, project, right? You can, you know, here are some very common, interesting diseases. Toxoplasmosis, uh, it's kind of a neat disease. It's carried by cats, right? It really kind of messes you up, right? It's really neat stuff. Malaria, extremely uh, important worldwide disease. Uh, Chagas disease is um, American sleeping sickness, right? It's, so it's like, um, it's like, um, sorry, it's caused by another species of trypanosoma. Um, the cool thing about this is it's kind of disgusting is that uh, so it's not a tsetse fly it's a different insect right it's called a kissing bug and it gets its name kissing bug because it likes to feed around the mouths of the humans uh, while you're sleeping right so it's all sit there and it's kind of like it's kind of kissing you while you're sleeping right I know really gross right um, some of these other disease trichomon uh, trichomoniasis is uh, one of the very common STD um, it's estimated that almost 4 million people carry this thing worldwide, right? But only 30% show symptoms, right? So it's this very important uh, STD, you know, typically we think of them as being bacterial or viral, but in this case it's caused by a protozoan. Uh, amoebiasis is uh, an incredibly important um, uh, protozoan intestinal illness, right? Um, they say about 480 million people are infected, you know, got about 40 million new cases worldwide, right? And of course, a lot of these are due to, uh, are found in areas where the um, sanitation is quite poor, right? So in many developing countries. All right, so moving on then from protozoan, well, let's talk about parasitic helminths, right? And if you thought the protozoans are gross, you know, this is the kind of stuff that really gets you the ujis because we're talking about the worms, right? Uh, nematodes are round worms, uh, platyhelminths or flatworms. Um, there are many types of helmets that are out there doing their thing, just like protozoans, just living, right? Um, but of course, we care about the parasitic ones, right? Because they're the ones that are going to, again, have major human impact. Um, parasitic helminths have a lot of characteristics that differ from free-living helminths. Generally, they, they lack a digestive system, right? So they don't have a really complex digestive system. They're kind of dependent on the host doing the digestion for them. Um, they have a reduced nervous system, right? Because they don't have to be out in the environment very much. Um, they just uh, kind of live, again, within this uh, very 
confines of the human host, right? So they don't, they're not all about sensing and responding to environments, right? They don't often move too much, right? But they have a very complex reproductive system. So just like some of these protozoans, you know, very complex life cycle, often interplay where they have succession of hosts. You know, one host leads to the next host. Sometimes they'll have, uh, they'll use each host for different types of reproduction. Now, the type of reproduction that these guys, um, these helmets can do uh, depends on the type of organism, right? So we have this free, um, this term dioecious which means that they have male reproductive organs in one, female in another, right? So some species are dioecious, right? In this case, uh, these cases, uh, we're talking about sexual reproduction only, right? Whereas uh, monoecious or hermaphroditic worms, um, they have both organs, right? So in this case, they can actually do asexual reproduction in the event that a suitable partner um, does not exist. All right, let's talk a little bit about each type, right? So the nematodes are the roundworms, right? So they're unsegmented uh, roundworms. Um, generally, they do have a complete digestive system in the fact that they have a mouth, intestines, and anus, right? Um, but again, they kind of really helps, or they like being in the host because the host does a lot of the digestion for them. Um, uh, Enterobius, uh, aka pinworm, is the most common uh, infection in the U.S., right? And it's kind of, um, again, you know, like I said, these things kind of give you the oogies, right? Uh, so I hope it doesn't get too weird for you, right? But uh, a pinworm uh, causes this itching around the anus, right? As it's starting to leave, you know, very similar way if you guys ever seen dogs kind of scooting, right? And they're scooting because they have like worms coming out of their uh, their exit hole, right? And it causes a little itching, you know? Um, same with pinworm. As the worms are itching, they're just kind of crawling around the exit hole, right, and causes this itching, right, and uh, it causes a really, again, I don't think I need to talk more about this, right? Uh, trichinella, I think many of us have heard of trichinella, right? It comes from eating undercooked pork, right, and for the most part, uh, one of the reasons that pork is generally frozen prior to selling in the store is because it's the freezing process can kill trichinella, right? So typically nowadays, you only you really only get trichinella from uh, pork that you catch, i.e. the boars that you hunt. The platy helmets are the flatworms, and the flatworms come in two forms, the flukes and the tapeworms. Um, flukes are like these, uh, these flat leaf-shaped things. They have like this oral sucker right there, right? What they use for attachment, right? And typically flukes are named after the tissue that it infects. So a lung fluke infects a lung, heart flukes infects uh, the heart. Tapeworms are segmented flatworms. So they're a little bit different from the um, flukes and the uh, nematodes in that they're segmented. So they have these little kind of regions, right? And each region uh, can have um, kind of exist independently. So if you cut them, typically they can regrow. Um, and then just like flukes, they use these suckers and sometimes these hooks for attachment, right? So they often hook, stick into your intestines, and uh, they kind of do their thing, right? So just like with uh, our protozoans, we're going to talk about a couple of these, uh, um, the helminths, right? And just talk about the life cycle. Uh, schistosoma is a very important uh, disease worldwide, right? Uh, sometimes called snail fever because of the fact that it lives. Uh, technically, we get it from snails, right? So it's a parasitic flatworm. The eggs are released from the snails, right? So where's the snail? Da, 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 da. Eggs hatch, right? And then, so they... Eggs are released from the snail, and then they are uh, free swimming in the water, right? And then you get schistosomiasis when you ingest it, right? So it's typically playing in the water that it's in. And, of course, in areas where, you know, you don't have clean water, you know, you're dependent on the river waters and this kind of stuff for to do things like your laundry, to cook in and things like that, right? Um, and if they're not uh, properly treated, then you're going to end up ingesting these things, right? And then it causes things like abdominal pain, diarrhea, bloody stool, right? And guess guess what happens? Guess how these things leave? Yeah, it's through the feces um, of the human, sometimes the urine, right? And so it's this expulsion. And again, as uh, with the areas that they don't have proper sanitation, right? The eggs make their back way back into the water, and then there um, they then are able to attack the the snail and then do their things in the snail, right? So again, this whole interplay where one they do this. Um, asexual reproduction and then the other they do the sexual reproduction right so this important interplay and they have to complete this life cycle it doesn't go from human to human doesn't go from uh, snail to snail uh taenia is um this disease called taeniasis right it's a uh, pork or beef tapeworm um and it's contracted by eating the live worms right so the uh they're 
really living in just the pork, I uh, sorry, the pigs uh, or the cows, right? Uh, hanging out in the mussels, kind of doing its thing, right? And then um, humans can get it when we eat raw or undercooked uh, meat that's been infected, right? So these are things that, of course, in the industry are going to be screened for quite often, right? So typically nowadays we only really get them for uh, from facilities that are quite negligent in keeping up with their screening, right? Or from wild pig, wild cattle. Um, symptoms are generally mild, right? A um, little bit of weight loss, some abdominal pain, and typically the pork tapeworm tends to be often more severe. Um, I included this one here because it has like this this urban legend, right? So back in the day, there's a lot of uh, um, historical references to people uh, on the tapeworm diet, right? And so as the story goes, you know, people would eat these cookies to help them lose weight. And what the cookies contain were the eggs of the, the tapeworm. Typically, um, it's, you know, it's never really been identified, but it's believed that it's Taenia, Um where then it grows and multiplies. You can eat what you want, right? And then it's out there doing its thing in your abdomen. Maybe you get a little bit of pain, right? But for the most part, you get this weight loss that kind of comes with it. Of course, because it's taken all your nutrition, right? And then the idea is that after a month or so, you're supposed to take like a second cookie, right? And that cookie has now the medication to get rid of the tapeworm, right? But some people, they were loving this weight loss so much that uh, they didn't take that second cookie, Right. But then, of course, if you don't get rid of it, then you really start to suffer from things like malnutrition and stuff like that. Right. Uh, believe it or not, people still do this nowadays. Right. Um, you know, apparently there's some treatment. I think you can go to Mexico and spend thousands of dollars for tapeworm diet treatments. Right. Uh, I think I saw an article somewhere where someone in Iowa tried it. Right. Because I guess they were just really wanting to lose some weight. Right. Um, so, you know, the FDA has to come out and say stuff like, the tapeworm diet is illegal. You have to be told this kind of stuff. Isn't that crazy? Um, but I don't know. I guess for some people, you know, vanity is quite an important thing, right? So I don't know about you. If someone says, hey, you can lose some weight by eating tapeworm, I'm like, you know, I think I'll pass, right? But, you know, for some people, it's like it's a quick and easy way to do this kind of stuff. Of course, extremely dangerous. Um, there are other common helminthic diseases, right? Um Ascariasis uh, is uh, probably the most common soil transmitted um, helminthic disease, right? Uh, I think they say an estimate of a billion people carry this thing, right? But the really cool thing about Ascariasis or Ascaria, the, the um, helminth that causes the disease, right? And so, whether it's a nematode, that's what this N refers to, is that uh, these are probably the largest helminths and these things can grow like over a foot in length. Isn't that crazy? Like this worm that's like over a foot long hangs out inside you. Madness. Um, Angiostrongyliasis is uh, better known here around here as, uh, let's just write that in there, as rat lungworm, right? So, you know, we've had a lot of incidents of this on the big, oops, sorry, we're supposed to call it on Hawaii Island, right? So Hawaii Island has this, really this endemic case of uh, a, pr a presence of angiostrongolus, the uh, organism that causes uh, rat lungworm, right? So uh, really interesting stuff. Um, and, you know, the craziest thing that some people say about this disease is that they wouldn't wish this on their worst enemy. You know, some say that's this uh, extreme impact, right? Extremely painful. And then oftentimes you can have lifelong effects of this kind of stuff, right? Okay. That's enough for the helmets, right? So we're now past the Uji phase, right? Now we're going to talk about the fungi, um, talk a little bit more about maybe the structures of the fungi. And remember, let's go back to um, this term mycology, right? The study of fungi, right? Uh, it's this whole M-Y-C prefix um, that denotes a fungus, right? A fungi can be multicellular, can be unicellular or single cell, right? And we've seen these things. Right, and we see the molds growing on your wall. We see the mold growing on your food. Those are clearly multicellular, right? But there are single-celled ones out there as well. Things like the yeast and stuff like that. Um, fungi are very important in the food chain. They decompose dead matter. They help recycle vital elements, right? And of course, you know, we use them things for food, right? Mushrooms, for example, are fungus, right? So we eat these things. You know, cheeses and stuff like that are often produced by fungi. We eat those things, right? Um, but they also help us uh, make uh, antibiotics, right? Uh, fermentation, all this really good stuff. 
Um, ultimately, they do cause disease, right? And the uh, mycoses, that will be plural, right? MYC, uh, that's a disease caused by a fungus, right? Singular here will be mycosis, right? Um, quick review, remember cell, uh, fungi have uh, cell walls made of chitin, right? So the chitin cell walls uh, are, uh, sorry, fungi have chitin cell walls, right? Kind of characteristic of fungi. Um, and then they have something called ergosterols in the membrane. Remember, um, eukaryotic cells have sterols, right? Fungi have ergosterols, which is, you know, more or less the same thing, but specific enough that if you can identify it, then you can classify it as a fungus, right? Uh, fungi are capable, capable of reproducing both sexually and asexually, right? Uh, sexual reproduction is often using spores, right? But you can also, uh, they can also reproduce uh, asexually, right? So, um, Again, the idea with asexual reproduction is that when they're growing rapidly, you want to do asexual reproduction, right? Because you can just really quickly, and they'll do this through mitosis. And then when you need to develop some um, uh, some genetic diversity, then you can do some sexual reproduction, right? Where we get together, uh, find a suitable mate. In this case, they call it a plus mating type, a minus mating type. Mix some gametes, right? And then produce uh, offspring that are genetically distinct. Uh, fungi can be classified or characterized, I guess, into three different types of fungi. The yeasts are unicellular or single-celled. Um, they reproduce by budding, right? So it's this mitosis produces like these little, you know, kind of imagine as like bubbles coming out of the yeast. Um, molds are multicellular, and we've seen molds, right? So the molds are uh, multicellular masses, and we'll talk about the molds very soon. And the dimorphic fungi can actually do both, right? It can grow as both the yeast or a mold and really depends on the environment. And many pathogens, many um, fungal pathogens uh, can be dimorphic, right? Where they can grow as yeast when the times are right, right? Typically as uh, when they're pathogenic, they'll grow as a yeast because they can do that really fast, right? But then sometimes uh, when, you know, things are not so good, they'll grow as a mold because the multicellular growth allows better survival of the organism as a whole. So speaking of molds, um, you know, multicellular growth is done by growing filaments, right? So we have these long filaments that grow, uh, and each filament is called a hypha, right? Hyphae for plural, right? So each hypha then just grows and elongates, right? And it's very important for the fungus to be able to do this because, um, you know, the this extending of filaments allows it access to food sources that are farther out, farther away, right? So then once again, allows for survival of the organism much better. Um, the hypha can be separated by uh, these walls, and this is what we would call a septate hypha. Um, or we can have non-septate hypha, also known as cenocytic, right? So again, it's very characteristic of the fungi, whether they form these divisions into these cell-like units, uh, these septate hyphae, or the non-septate hyphae, the cenocytic, right? Uh, occasionally, what you're going to get is something called a pseudo hyphae. Right, where cells just kind of clump together, right? They're not really hyphae, right? They have to kind of elongate, right? But, uh, you know, because they're sort of multicellular, they've been given this name pseudo-hyphae, right? Now, as we have a bunch of hyphae kind of growing together, uh, that's often called a mycelium, and that's because the filaments are just so long and so massive and so intertwining that it's really hard to distinguish um, each different fungus, right? Or the thallus. Now, thallus would be the body of a fungus. Each individual organism would have a thallus, right? But they typically, they all kind of grow amongst each other, right? So this whole network is called this uh, mycelium. Uh, fungi are grouped according to things like their life cycle, their sexual spores. There are seven major groups, right? But depending on uh, which classification system you use, sometimes they'll have a little bit more, right? But we're only going to talk about these three, the zygomycota, Ascomycota, Basidiomycota. And again, notice MYC, right? Re referencing uh, the fungus. And we'll just talk a little bit about uh, some of the major characteristics of each of these groups. Um, the Zygomycota produce cenocytic hyphae. They use something called zygospores for sexual reproduction uh, and sporangiospores for asexual reproduction. So these guys are actually characterized by these, these long sporangia that uh, kind of extend up right, off the surface, and then have their spores in this sac, right, and that's what the sporangiospore is, right, so this these things coming up, 
um, things like rhizopus, which is uh, what we call a bread mold, right? So typically the, the white fluffy thing growing on your bread is um, uh, rhizopus, right? So it kind of grows up and then it has these little black uh, sporangia or at the top, right? Each sporangium contains hundreds of spores, which then will pop and then burst, okay? Uh, mucor is a very important uh, zygomycota. It uh, causes necrotizing infection, right? So it's just this very rapid, uh, causes uh, tissue death, right? So um, in the systemic infection. The ascomycota are, uh, in this case, characterized by a septate hyphae, right? So they have uh, these divisions, right? And they use um, ascospores for sexual reproduction, conidia for uh, asexual reproduction. And so they're characterized by this whole naked cluster of spores, right? So the sporangial spores, um, the zygomycota have this sac around their spores, right? Here they have just kind of everything in chains. Uh, Aspergillus is such an interesting genus, right? Because uh, Aspergillus... Um, causes you know can cause allergies so many people are allergic to aspergillus uh, spores right they cause a lot of neural infections right As aspergillus flavus produces this um really powerful neurotoxin called an aflatoxin that contain contaminates nuts and grains right but some species of aspergillus provides food for us so shoyu if you guys don't know where shoyu comes from it's fermented soybean and the thing that they use to ferment it is a species of aspergillus right so i always find that fascinating like within a genus right all these related organisms we have these guys that are extremely deadly you know causing producing this powerful neurotoxin yet its cousin we used to do and make maybe the most wonderful food product next to beer uh shoyu right and can you imagine life without shoyu i think we would riot wouldn't we um, Candida albicans is another very important ascomycota. Um, it's uh, actually what we typically, it's a commensal organism. It just kind of lives within us, hangs out with us, right? It's found in the vagina. It's found in the throat, in the uh, intestines, right? Just hangs out there. But every now and then, it can cause the disease, right? So we call this an opportunistic pathogen, right? So every now and then, when given the opportunity, it'll cause disease, Right, so you know, so it can cause yeast infections, vaginal yeast infections. Uh, thrush is this this infection of the throat, right? So it can cause disease, but you know, for the most part, it doesn't, right? So it's one of these. Hey, sometimes we like you, sometimes we don't. Uh, finally, the basidial mycota um, have these club-shaped structures that produce spores within this thing called a basidial carp, aka a mushroom, right? So. Um, the basidial mycota are maybe the most famous in that, you know, these are the things that we think of as a fungus. Oh, yeah, fungus, mushrooms, right? I love eating these things, right? Um, very important decomposers, right? And the, whenever you see fungus, you know that there's a bunch of organics around because the, these guys are just going to be eating them up like crazy. Of course, um, you know, not all fungi are edible, right? Uh, so be careful. Don't just look at a fungus and say, oh, or a mushroom and say, oh, we're going to eat this thing, right? They're not all edible. Um, and then we have some very important basidiomycetes or basidiomycota. The cryptococcus neoformans causes very serious um, respiratory infection, right? In fact, it's this, uh, um, it's this uh, disease where you often get by inhaling uh, the yeast, right? This cryptococcus. And it's uh, often uh, one of the most important uh, or infection of AIDS patients, right? AIDS patients have a very reduced immune system, right? Uh, typically, it doesn't cause too many issues, Right, but for AIDS patients, you know, this is it's one of the major leading causes of death for AIDS patients. Um, Amanita phylloides, uh, aka the death cap, is an extremely powerful uh, toxin. All right, uh, this poisonous mushroom. Right, but interestingly, um, the toxin itself, because they know the mechanism of action, has been used to elucidate a lot of things in molecular biology. Right, because of the the proteins that it attacks. Um, so just like before, you know, we'll talk about some of these uh, ringworm, right? That's kind of a very common, uh, especially here in Hawaii, it's quite endemic, right? Uh, ringworm is not a worm, right? It's actually a fungal infection, right? But it's called a ringworm because it forms this ring on your skin, right? And looks kind of like this worm that's been borrowing through your skin, right? But it's not a worm, it's a fungus, right? Um, athlete's foot, right? Um, sporotrichosis is kind of interesting. It's this, um, also known as a skin rose... Oh, sorry, a rose gardener's disease or rose thorn disease, right? It's uh, typically a gardener's infection. Uh, and so it's through um, 
pricks and through cuts and scrapes, which the fungus then gets into and under the skin, right? And in there, it causes generally some mild uh, skin symptoms, right? But it can cause some more serious cases. In the case that you inhale it, it can get to the lungs. If it gets deep into your tissue, it can cause problem in your joints. But interestingly enough, uh, you know, um, feral cats are kind of carriers of, um, of this disease, sporothrix. Right, and it's actually an, considered an occupational hazard for veterinarians, right? As these cats, you know, with their scratches and things like that, they can introduce the fungal spores into the skin, and many veterinarians can get sporotrichosis, right? Because of the fact uh, that cats introduce it to them. Okay, so that's enough about fungi. Let's talk a little bit about algae. Right, algae are what we call autotrophs. They use inorganic carbon. All right, we'll learn more about that. Um, Coming up uh, next, yeah, I believe it's next module. Yeah, good stuff, right? Uh, we're going to learn about photosynthesis, right? They're called phototrophs. Um, <clears throat> they uh, collectively, algae produce about 70% of oxygen uh, and organics in aquatic environments, right? So they produce so much oxygen for us, right? And worldwide, you know, there are many other types of algae that grow everywhere, right? They really contribute to this oxygen that we breathe. Um, just like the, many of the organisms we talked about, they can reproduce both sexually and asexually. They can grow single-celled. They can be enormous, as we will see. Um, typically, we classify them according to cell structures, uh, according to the pigments that they use, right? There will be different types of photosynthetic pigments. So let's talk about some of the groups, um, some of the uh, common groups of um, algae. Um, Dinoflagellates are probably the most uh, significant, maybe? Maybe not. But they're definitely amongst the more pathogenic ones, right? Because of the fact that many of these are able to produce toxins, right? They're called dinoflagellates because of the fact that they have this cellulose armor, right? This kind of, look at this armored thing, right? Single-celled. And they use this one flagellum to, single, to whirl. So it just kind of twists and whirls and moves around, right? So it's quite motile, able to do what it does. And some of them do something called bioluminescence or bioluminesce, which is this, this glowing cause because they have these organs that uh, trap bacteria that are able to glow, right? So this is uh, from your book, terribly grainy, by the way, right? But, you know, the, here's a shoreline and way off in the distance, this glow is these dinoflagellates out there that are able to, to bioluminesce, right? Um, Alexandrium is an example of uh, one of these types of um, dinoflagellates that... Uh, cause something called paralytic shellfish poisoning. Try to say that real fast, right? Um, and then they produce this toxin, right? This really powerful toxin, which in and of itself isn't that big a deal, right? But every now and then, you know, they have this something called a red tide, right? Um, they call it that because Alexandrium is red, by the way. Um, it's a red pigment that it uses for photosynthesis, right? Every now and then, when the conditions are perfect for Alexandrium, and it just grows this huge abundance, so much so that the ocean looks red, right? So we have a ton of these guys swimming around, and then as they settle, it then causes this buildup of the toxin, which then accumulates in shellfish, right? And this accumulation then, as you eat it, uh, makes you extremely sick, right? So... Um, this whole idea of paralytic shellfish poisoning. And that's kind of a theme for a lot of these uh, dinoflagellates. Uh, seaweed, of course, are also algae. And, you know, seaweed can be very small. It can be extremely large, right? And some of these large brown uh, algae, these brown kelp forests, uh, are hundreds of meters long, right? So here, I know it looks green, right? But that's because of the fact we're underwater, right? But we have these super enormous, long, tree-sized uh, brown algae, right? We have these red algae and these green. And the reason that they're all these different colors is because they use different pigments for photosynthesis, right? And it allows them to live at different depths. The green ones are the ones that are closest to the surface. They're going to do photosynthesis very similar to plants. And then as we start to go down, you know, I think, I think red, ooh, 50-50, right? I think red are the ones that are going to grow deepest because the light kind of filters out. So some of the green light doesn't make its way down. So it has to use different wavelengths of light for photosynthesis. Um, they're very plant-like, right? They have these leaf-like structures, these stalk-like structures, these special structures we call hold fast to attach to things, right? But they're not really like leaves. They're not really stalks. They're not really roots, right? And they are fully dependent on the water environment uh, for them to go and... Um, uh, for them to survive. 
that's pretty much all we want to say about algae, right? Um, I mean, if you look at the theme of the, al uh, the diseases that algae cause, you know, many of these are going to go and be very similar to the red tide, the Alexandrian we just talked about, right? A lot of this stuff is uh, this accumulation of um, this toxin that then kind of builds its way up to the food cycle. I think maybe for us, the most uh, significant of this is cigaterra fish poisoning, right? Again, the idea is that uh, cigaterra is going to go and uh, build up, produce these toxins, right? They get eaten by these small little things, which then get eaten by bigger fish, right? And then as this big fish eats a bunch of these, it starts to accumulate, right? And then when the human eats it, well, then you get yourself some serious infection, right? Uh, some fish poisoning. Uh, lichen, I think lichen would be our last eukaryotic group, right? Of uh, microbe. I don't know why I said right, of course. I know you don't, right? So the lichen are the last group we're going to talk about. Uh, lichen are interesting because they're this mutualistic combination of an algae, right? An alga, singular, um, or a cyanobacterium, which is a bacterium, right? So you can actually have this. It's either an algae or a cyanobacterium and a fungus, right? And mutualistic. And remember what mutualistic means? Both organisms benefit, right? The alga produces food, right, through photosynthesis, so it'll photosynthesize, do its thing, produce carbohydrates. The fungus provides a holdfast or protection. It kind of wraps itself around uh, the algae and then allows it to, um, to survive and just live in areas that really are unsuitable for either, right? So, and lichen then can, because of the fact that they're really not dependent on a food source and because of the fact that the fungus allows it to stick everywhere, they grow in the weirdest places any surface right um, they can grow on the surface of plants uh, and anything that grows on the surface of a plant is called an epiphyte right so we're used to seeing them on things like rocks on trees on your fence right what is up with that right um, and you know they're slow growing because they're kind of dependent on this this photosynthesis and really nothing else right there's not a lot of moisture typically where they live right but they can be slow growing because they're really not competing with anything else um, it is interesting because they are technically two organisms, right? But really, each one of these parts cannot survive without the other. Um, however, they are more classified as a fungus, right? And the fungus that uh, that is part of the lichen is typically an ascomycota or basidiomycota, right? Um, and just like you know, we're going to use the same terms of a fungus, right? The whole fungus, or sorry, the lichen itself is called uh, a thallus, right? So that's the body of the lichen. Um, the cortex is the kind of the fungal layer of top protection, but then we have the algae right on top, right? So the algae or the cyanobacterium lives right underneath that, right? Protected from the harsh environment, but close enough so then it can do its photosynthesis. And then the rest of this allows the uh, lichen to kind of stick to its thing. Now, lichen are classified according to what they're capable of sticking to, right? So crustose lichen grow flat on the surface, you know, crusty, right? They look crusty, right? And they're very common on rocks. Um, folios have these leaf-like projections right so this is something we'll often see around here right um i have some growing on my fence just doing its thing you know sometimes i'm wondering should i scrape it off because i don't like it but you know it is photosynthesizing it is producing things right so eh, usually i just leave it right and fruticose lichen are these uh branched leaf finger like sorry projections right this long and they look kind of like moss right and so but they're not really right there's this again this combination moss is a plant this would be this combination of a fungus and an algae. Um, as with everything, we're going to talk about some of the diseases that they cause. But sorry, folks, um, lichen, they're pretty nice, right? They don't really do too much in terms of uh, uh, causing disease, right? In fact, um, many produce uh, antimicrobial compounds. Uh, some have been, um, are in the works for things like anti-cancer, anti-HIV treatment as well. Uh, traditionally, the, because of these really interesting colors that they produce. And in fact, some of these you can stick in water. And then the water turns red, even though it's green. It's kind of weird. Produce these pigments that are used to dye wool. And then uh, they're often been used as indicators of air pollution because they're so sensitive to things, right? You know, when uh, lichen are able to flourish, we say that we think that the air is good, right? But as a lichen number starts to decrease, um, it's kind of an indicator that the air pollution is uh, starting to increase and it's uh, really affecting the lichen population. Maybe the most... I don't know, let's call it bad lichen, is uh, Letharia vulpina, right? And it's a somewhat toxic to mammals, right? Whatever that means, right? So it's not really deadly. Um, humans, you know, you, maybe you'll get a little bit sick, but it's really not a big deal for humans. Uh, but traditionally, they were used to trap things like wolves and foxes, right? So 
uh, way back in the day when we used to live in villages and then wolves and foxes would come and eat your chickens and your goats and things like that, right? They'd lay out these little traps. They'd put out, um, you know, dead goats or, you know, meat and then they'd lace it with lotharia, right? And then the, the wolves and the foxes would eat it and then hopefully keep them away. Okay, so that's enough for eukaryotic microbes. Um, if you want to take a break, now will be a good time to take a break as we shift gears to viruses, right? So viruses are going to come up next. Um, we'll talk about viruses, and then that'll kind of finish off our whole other microbes thing, right? Um, if you don't want to take a break, or if you're ready now, let's talk about viruses. So I say this for pretty much all microbes, right? But viruses are super cool, you know? Um, and like we're going to get into these even weird kind of virus things that are like insane, like blow your mind kind of stuff, right? But really, viruses are these things, they're, they're not considered living, right? And this is like this, what they call this aggregation of non-living chemicals, which are inert. They don't really seem to do much. They're metabolically inactive. But you put them in the, the right cell, you put them in the right situation. All of a sudden, this virus seemingly comes to life, right? Even though it's not living. And it forces this cell to do these things, make many, many copies of these viruses, right? So it's really cool, really neat how, um, you know, the way viruses work. And again, some of these other virus-like things, it's just really interesting how, uh, you know, we always say biology just kind of finds a way, right? Um, so, you know, let's start off with this general list of uh, characteristics of viruses. And I think this goes back to our first module. Remember, viruses are acellular, right? They are not cells. And we talked about the list of things that are cells, right? They have to, um, you know, they contain ribosomes. They contain membranes. They contain this and that, right? Viruses don't contain any of these things, right? So they're not cells. So oftentimes we refer to them as particles, right? So uh, particles... Uh, later, we'll turn, learn this term called virions. Um, and as such, viruses are not on the tree of life, not living, right? They're especially small. You cannot really see them using a, a microscope. You need something called an electron microscope to see it, right? So that's the only way we've ever really seen viruses. And they can't be filtered from solution, right? So we don't have filters with holes small enough to capture viruses, right? So that's kind of our definition of what is small. Bacteria, we can filter them, right? We have Filters that can catch viruses, not for viruses. Uh, sorry, bacteria, but not for viruses. Um, viruses contain a single type of nucleic acid. Here we have DNA or RNA, right? Remember, what do we have as cells? We have both, right? We have DNA and RNA, right? Um, of course, we use them for different things. Here we have um, things that have a DNA genome or an RNA genome. Right, which we th always think is weird because we said genetic information, that's DNA. Well, viruses don't necessarily have to use DNA. In fact, they do really weird things as we'll see later. And then they are surrounded by a protein coat called a capsid that surrounds this nucleic acid. Right, And then some of those are enclosed by an envelope which is sort of like a plasma membrane. And then that's it. That's what a virus is. Right, So pretty simple uh, for the most part. Um, all viruses are obligate intracellular parasites, which means all viruses are infectious. No such thing as a non-infectious virus. Um, there's no metabolic activity, so when you look at a virus, when you measure it, it really doesn't do anything, right? Um, but when you put it inside a living cell, it'll multiply, right? It'll multiply, it'll force the cell to do uh, what it needs to do. Um, and then, you know, in order to distinguish the virus from its many stages of the life cycle, right? Because you can have viral RNA or DNA floating around. You can have viral parts floating around, right? None of which are infectious, right? Uh, only when it's fully comp um, only when it's fully synthesized, when it's fully put together, is it fully infectious, right? And that's what we call a virion, right? So sometimes we'll see this term a lot, um, not virus, but virion. And virion means that it's fully infectious, fully capable of doing its own thing. Uh, viruses very rarely carry enzymes. Some have no enzymes. Some have one or two, um, as they're completely dependent on host cells, which actually makes treating viruses difficult because since they're going to use your ribosomes, since they're going to use your enzymes, you know, if we want to stop them from replicating, we are in many ways going to stop ourselves from doing normal cell functions, right? So drugs that target the 
uh, replication is are also going to target us, right? So um, there has to be different ways of using therapeutics, right? If viruses don't have their own unique enzymes. Um, something that's not always understood is that all cells can be infected, even bacteria. You know, we think of bacteria, oh, these little guys that are going to go and do things, cause infection, right? But they can also be infected by viruses, right? So all cells have some sort of virus that can infect it. Now, this infection is limited to what's called a suitable host, right? So a virus can infect all cells, right? So just because all cells can be infected doesn't mean each virus can infect all cells, right? So we have this term called a host range, which is the range of host cells a virus can infect. And almost always, typically, it's one cell type of one host species, right? So viruses are very particular in what they're capable of infecting. And typically, this is determined by things like the virus's ability to attach and the availability of host cells, uh, sorry, host cell factors for multiplying the virus itself, right? So, you know, it's not that the virus doesn't want to infect, right? But if it can't stick, it's not going to be able to infect. Or if it can stick, but the host cell that it's stuck to doesn't have the right machinery to be able to replicate the virus, it's not going to work for the virus as well, right? So this uh, viral host range, this narrow host range, uh, gives potential in disease therapy. Um, imagine something like bacteriophages, which infect bacteria. And again, they're not going to infect all bacteria. They're going to infect very specific bacteria, sometimes specific strains of bacteria. So we can actually treat bacterial infections using bacteriophages, right? And then it doesn't affect the other bacteria that are around us. And of course, it won't infect us. Um, oncolytic viruses, the word onc uh, or onco, uh, refers to cancer, right? So remember lytic for lysis, right? These are viruses that can lyse or break tumor cells, right? So oncolytic viruses can be used to, again, specifically infect tumor cells without uh, affecting our normal cells. Uh, when we talk about viruses being small, there are, you know, let's just go really, really small, right? Here are the kind of limits of the light microscope. You know, this flu virus, and this would be like an enormous ginormous flu virus it's you know basically at the super tiny limits but really what we're talking about is um you know we'd have to have some super special light microscopes to see these things right so typically this is kind of the area in which um you know most light microscopes work right smaller than that are electron microscopes right and then oftentimes in order to be able to see anything in this range uh, requires special coloring, special tagging, and things like that, right? So typically, you know, we saw they're really small, much, much smaller than bacteria, right? Much, much smaller than uh, parts of the cell. Um, like we said, all viruses consist of a nucleic acid, right? Remember, RNA or DNA surrounded by a capsid. And at its base, this is what a virus looks like. Nucleic acid surrounded by some sort of protein coat, right? Um, so here we have an example of a nucleic acid. In this case, this would be DNA, and then this would be its protein coat, right? Each individual protein in the coat is called a capsomere. Two general types of viruses, we call them non-enveloped or naked viruses. Basically, it's just a capsid with its uh, nucleic acid. And then enveloped viruses, which is surrounded by a lipid membrane, right? So here we have its uh, nucleic acid. Here's the capsid that surrounds it. And then we have... Uh, lipid bilayer envelope, which is essentially a plasma membrane that it got from its host that it infected, right? And then viruses often have these things called spikes, which are typically glycoproteins, right? proteins with uh, carbohydrate moieties stuck on the structure, and they're typically used either to bind to the host or to be released from the host, right? So they can do both, and they'll need both the spike to stick to and sometimes to leave the host as well. Now, when uh, we put viruses together, or so when viruses uh, um, are made, they, have, they can put their viral structure or the capsid uh, together slightly different. So helical viruses are cylindrical or rod-shaped, right? So they have this long rod. Typically, they look like sticks right here. So it's tobacco mosaic virus. And just these individual sticks that you see are the tobacco mosaic virus. And they can be rigid like this, right? So they are these long, uh, very stiff, uh, rods, or they can be flexible. So Ebola virus is an example of a helical virus that's flexible, right? So it looks kind of like a snake, 
Uh, polyhedral viruses on the other end, poly meaning many, hedro for sides, many sided, right? So we have uh, something like this. Again, here's our nucleic acid, the capsid. In this case, we have many, many shapes kind of um, put together. And the most common shape is this thing called an icosahedron, which has 20 sides and 12 corners, but other shapes exist as well. And then these viruses can either be enveloped or non-enveloped, right? So you can actually have a helical envelope virus or helical non-enveloped virus, polyhedral enveloped or um, envelope polyhedral or non-enveloped polyhedral. Um, <clears throat> this covers most viruses. There are some things called complex viruses where there are other structures attached to a capsid, right? So here's, um, Here's our capsid, once again, our genome. And then sometimes there will be other things attached to that. And typically these other things are used for uh, stuff like attachment, stuff like DNA delivery, right? So these tail fibers, this is a uh, bacteriophage that infects bacteria. So these tail fibers stick, are used to attach to the bacterium. The sheath is almost like a syringe that punctures the bacterium. And then that sends or allows for a tunnel for the bacteriophages to uh, enter. Okay, so these are complex viruses, other structures attached to that. Um, we do classify uh, and do have, have a taxonomy of viruses. Um, generally, we don't use genus and species names because of the fact that, um, you know, they're, they don't really like to be put on the tree of life, right? So often we refer to bacteria via um, families and genera, right? And um, these are based on things like their genetics, uh, strategy for replication, as we'll talk about, their shape, their morphology. Um, their biochemistry and that, you know, the types of molecules that they're composed of. Um, general rule, and this kind of is a rule for um, all nomenclature is that family names end in viridae and then genus names end in virus, right? And then sometimes, usually they are italicized given that they are uh, Latin and they are classical names. Um, species names can be used, but typically when they are used, they are often... Um, a common name, right? So it's a, some sort of descriptive common name, and then any subspecies can be designated by a number. Uh, so, for example, we have, uh, and don't memorize this list, please, right? I just want to go and show you some of these things. Uh, often you'll see something like uh, herpes viridae, right? The viridae indicates that we're talking about a family of viruses, uh, retroviridae, a family of viruses, right? And then it's um, it's a common name, right? Uh, you know, lentivirus, alphavirus, uh, rhinovirus, sorry, the genus name. All right, so these will be genus names, and you can tell because of the fact that it's uh, italicized, right? Um, now, when we talk about uh, something like, let's say, Ebola virus or influenza virus, right? So here we have influenza virus, right? That's the uh, genus name because it's italicized. The common name for influenza virus is influenza virus right so that's its species and then we can designate it by influenza a b or c or some sort of strain number same with hiv we hiv1 hiv2 etc 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 so we'll talk a little bit about the life cycle of viruses uh, we'll start off with um prokaryotic hosts and here's our proud parent moment this really cool picture was taken by one of our students we uh we're studying some bacteriophages uh, that are capable of infecting uh, pseudomonas aeruginosa and so we took this to the electron microscope lab here at Manoa, and then they happened to catch this virus just as these, sorry, this uh, the cell, just as these viruses are being released, right? So bacteri bacteriophages are viruses that infect bacteria. And then um, we have two different life cycles, one called a virulent phage that leads to uh, violent death through lysis, like we're seeing right over here, and then something called a temperate phage, where the phage becomes part of the host DNA. Uh, and then whenever the host replicates, uh, the virus gets replicated as well. However, eventually the, vi um, it's, uh, the cell is induced to make new viruses, these progeny virus. So then this temperate phage will eventually become a virulent phage, as we'll talk about. Um, the viral life cycle can be quite complex. We're going to try to keep this as, as simple as possible. Try to use this general broad brush, right? Uh, starting with the lytic cycle for lytic phages. Um, and uh, all vi um, virus life cycles start off with uh, attachment, right? So we, here we have attachment where the phage attaches to the surface of the host. Um, and for bacteriophages, they're going to use these uh, tail fibers. And then we have uh, penetration whereby the uh, phage DNA gets uh, injected into 
um, our bacterium. All right, so first things first, attachment. Then we have uh, insertion of viral DNA into the host cell. And then we have biosynthesis. And in biosynthesis, what what's going to happen is that we're going to take all these parts. Here we have our phage parts. Here we have our phage nucleic acid, right? All that stuff gets made, right? So the cell basically has stopped doing what it does. And it's completely uh, turned over into this virus factory. Uh, during maturation, everything is put together. Now we're assembling new phage particles, right? Now we're creating these new virions. And then uh, lysis, cell lysis. All these phages on the inside then are released. And then these will go on then to infect. Oops. These will then go on to infect our new host cells, right? And when it comes to things like phage therapy, where we can use phages to uh, treat uh, bacterial infection, lytic phages are the most useful because of the fact that they immediately destroy our cells, right? Now, temperate phage undergo what's called a lysogenic cycle, right? It starts the same. We have attachment. We have penetration, right? However, after penetration, the phage genome or the phage DNA becomes incorporated into the host genome, right? So now it becomes part of the host cell, right? This blue part is the phage DNA. And then whenever the cell divides, uh, the phage is going to get copied, right? And this is what's called a prophage, right? So the prophage is that right there. Right? And so the prophage DNA is going to be passed on to our daughter cells every single time the cell divides, right? Um, sometimes the phage brings with it some uh, interesting properties, right? Some, uh, some other genes, right? And in that case, that's called uh, lysogenic or sometimes called phage conversion, right? But typically it's called uh, lysogenic conversion. And that's a change in the cell due to the phage, right? And there are some pathogens actually that have its ability to cause disease because of the fact that it has a prophage. And this prophage brings with it things like toxins and things like other factors that allow this bacterium then to infect, right? And then this host cell would then be called the lysogeny, right? At some point, the uh, prophage pops out, right? And then now we go and continue our life cycle, right? So now here we have biosynthesis where we're gonna make the parts. We have maturation where everything is put together and then lysis, right? So then the whole life cycle then completes. These are then gonna go on, infect our next cell, and then the uh, cycle will continue. Okay, so that's your basic life cycle. We're gonna just keep it that simple. Um, typically, phages will have DNA genomes, right? It's uh, rare for them to have any other type of genome. So typically, they're DNA genomes um, undergoing some very simple life cycle. Attachment, penetration, biosynthesis, maturation, release. Every now and then, we have lysogeny, right? Or the formation, uh, formation of a prophage if you're a temperate phage. Um, animal hosts are similar, right? So the um, animal viruses... Sorry, did I say animal hosts? Animal viruses have a very similar life cycle to a lytic phage, right? So our lytic animal viruses are similar to a lytic phage. They differ by some very specific mechanisms, right? Um, most specifically, this thing called uncoding, right? So actually, if we look at this, it looks very similar. We have attachment, right? So it's got to attach. We have penetration, right? In this case, penetration is um, the uh, virion makes its way into... Uh, the host cell. And then we'll have uncoding. And an uncoding is this release of the nucleic acid from the capsid, right? So the, nu the capsid gets shed. Now the nucleic acid comes in, right? So that's different from uh, phages, where phages will inject their DNA in. This it doesn't quite work like that, right? The virus enters, and then it needs to be uncoded, right? After uncoding, very simple, similar stuff. We got some biosynthesis. In this case, assembly is maturation, and then we have release. Um, because of the fact that animals are a lot more complex, right? Typically, viruses will only be able to infect a certain animal, right? Um, but also a certain tissue. And this is what we call tissue tropism. It's a tissue specific infection of a host cell, right? So, for example, influenza virus uh, really only infects the respiratory tract. If it comes in another way, if it doesn't have access to the cells of the respiratory tract, the influenza virus will not be able to infect you, right? Same with polio virus, it's a uh, central nervous system infecting virus, right? So, you know, breathed in, it may not get access to where it needs to get to, right? So it's very important that viruses not only make its way to the specific host, also the specific tissue. Um, 
Now, viruses really, you know, animal viruses tend to be a lot more complex than bacteriophages. And a lot of this uh, complexity lies in the biosynthesis phage. And the reason for that is because animal viruses have this incredibly diverse array of genomes, right? And by that, I mean, you know, we, of course, have our, what we think of as a normal genome, our double-stranded DNA genome, right? That's what we have. That's what bacteria have, double-stranded genomes. We speak that language, right? But uh, animal viruses can also have some really strange things like single-stranded DNA, which is kind of weird to us, right? But they can also have RNA genomes, right? Single-stranded RNA, double-stranded RNA, right? And then to make things even more complicated, we can have what's called a plus-strand, single-stranded RNA, a minus-strand, single-stranded RNA, right? And that's really talking about which side of the genome that it is. Is it the side that it's going to use, or is it the side that looks like or complementary to the side that it's going to use? Um, RNA viruses then bring an extra complexity, right? Because we're not used to doing things like copying RNA regularly, right? So typically, um, in the, during the biosynthesis stage, um, RNA viruses often have this thing, this RDRP, or something called an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, right? And this is a viral enzyme, a viral encoded enzyme, which means it comes with it in its own uh, genome, um, that then can take this... Uh, uh, single-stranded RNA, turn that eventually into double-stranded DNA, right, sorry, copy itself, and then that eventually gets turned into double-stranded, uh, um, double-stranded or single-stranded uh, positive sense RNA, which then can get uh, converted to a host ribosome, uh, sorry, used by our host ribosomes to make viral proteins, right? So this RDRP is very important, so much so that it's um, often the target for therapeutics, right? Many therapeutics uh, well, targeting viral-specific enzymes, right? Because if we can knock out and target this RDRP, then the virus will not be able to copy itself. Retroviruses are a special class of RNA genomes. All right, so RNA viruses, right? Retroviruses are these positive strand, single-stranded RNA genomes, right? And then what they do, uh, aside from having an RDRP is this thing called a reverse transcriptase, right? So whereas the RDRP is used to take um, the RNA genome and get copied into more RNA, right? So then through the biosynthesis, a reverse transcriptase does uh, the opposite. It takes this single-stranded RNA genome and turns it into double-stranded DNA, right? So here we have HIV, which is our, our classic retrovirus, right? And then uh, let's go, what is this? What part of the life cycle is this? Number one, that's attachment, right? Good. And then we have entry, right, or penetration. So we have the entry of the virus, in this case, the capsid. And then now we're stripping the capsid away. This is called uncoding, right? Good. So we have uncoding. And then now our single-stranded RNA gets turned into double-stranded DNA. And then just like with our lysogenic viruses, this double-stranded RNA now becomes part of the genome, right? And this is what we call uh, a provirus, right? Prophage for our bacteriophage. In this case, now it's a provirus, right? So now whenever the cell uh, copies itself, the virus gets copied. More importantly, it hides from the immune system. It hides from everyone else because it's just DNA stuck inside the cell somewhere. Uh, and again, after... Uh, quote unquote some period of time, right? The provirus pops out. And then now we start to undergo biosynthesis. We start to make uh, and maturation, start to make mature virions, and then we now leave the cell and then they can go on and infect themselves a new cell. Okay. So the type of viral life cycle then lends itself to the type of viral infection. Right. And most viruses cause what's called an acute infection. Right, it's this short viral infection, right? The way I like to call it is it's uh, it's acute infection. Cute, short and sweet, right? Um, basically because it just undergoes its lytic life cycle, right? It's gonna infect, stuff is gonna happen, it's gonna get copied, biosynthesis, maturation, right? Release, and then either it's gonna win and we die, or hopefully our immune system will win, and then the virus is uh, eliminated, right? And something like the cold and the flu are what we call an acute infection, right? Short. Uh, persistent infections are long-term infections due to an inability to clear viruses, right? And that's because um, we're unable to 
uh, clear it, either because we lack the mechanism to do so, right, or because the virus hides, right? And so there's two general types, one called a latent infection, and in a latent infection, the virus remains hidden for a long period of time, right? So if we, if we look at this on a graph, right, you know, we could have something like uh, an acute infection, right? This is over time. Right, we have a, that's a T. That's a T. We can have uh, the virus replicates. We start to beat the virus. The virus is gone. That would be an acute infection, right? In a latent infection, it would be no virus or no virions for a long time. And then at some point, we then have our, uh, it pops out. It starts to replicate, right? And then, again, things happen, right? So, um, but typically, you are symptomless for long periods of time. So something like shingles is um, a latent infection in that, you know, we'd have our initial chickenpox infection, and then uh, the virus just kind of hides somewhere, right? We don't see it for a long time, and at some point when it decides to, it'll pop out, and then uh, you get yourself your little shingles, right? As opposed to a chronic infection, which is this this long, persistent infection, right, where you have this gradual buildup, oops, that's a little high, of virions, and then, again, once again, we either, it pops to life and then we clear it, or it pops to life and we die, right? So HIV is an example of a chronic infection after a period of latency, right? So actually, HIV is kind of a combination where um, the infection will always have this acute phase, right? It'll be quiet for a long time, and then this gent gradual chronic infection, right? And usually at that point, uh, it's kind of uh, it's kind of not good for you, right? And chronic infections tend to be real bad because it slowly weakens the immune system, and makes you more and more susceptible to things. So we do, I do want to talk about plant viruses just a little bit. Um, you know, I think my botanist friend would uh, not be happy if I didn't talk about plant viruses. For the most part, very similar, right? They're going to go through the exact same life cycle. Um, genetically, they're not quite as diverse, so most of them are, have a positive strand, single um, positive strand, single stranded RNA genome, and a uh, little different in that uh, viruses tend to have this really broad host range. Some plant viruses can infect thousands of plants. It's crazy, right? Um, and generally, uh, plant viruses tend to be what's called biotrophic. Uh, in that they infect without killing the host, right? So it does cause damage. It does do a lot of things, right? Um, generally, it's not fatal, right? But over time, the plant gets all weak um, and weird looking and all that kind of stuff. Um, and generally, it doesn't ca it causes a lot of problems, especially if it's a commercial crop, right? So um, I think one of the more famous ones around here was the papaya ring spot virus, which really decimated the uh, papaya industry uh, on uh, Hawaii Island. And then... Um, which then led to the introduction of the genetically modified papaya, right? So there's a really cool story about that, the rainbow papaya. You guys can look it up on YouTube, I believe, right? Papaya ring spot virus. So really cool stuff. And so that's the main reason I wanted to talk about plant viruses, right? Even though they don't really um, cause too much trouble in the, in the sense that, you know, obviously they're going to infect humans, right? But they have this huge uh, economic impact, right? Because uh, anything that targets... Uh, commercial crops can really um, decimate the industry. Um, one super quick look at the viral growth curve, right? So here um, we talk about the what's called a one-step growth curve, right? Which measures the amount of virions present for after one round of uh, viral replication, right? And this allows us to do a few things, right? So first of all, here we have an initial infection, right? So the number of virions, and then this drop in virion number and this would be free virions floating around right so what do you think why do you think we go from this infection to all of a sudden a sudden drop in virion number where do they go yeah that's right they have to go inside the cells right so you know, we're always going to be infected by a certain number of virions and then they're going to drop right as they enter the cells and then it's during this time that we undergo this biosynthesis maturation if we have this latency or the lysogeny that's all going to be there but at some point, it's now going to go into the release, and then we see this release, right? So what ends up happening is that uh, as we have infected the cells, all the cells are going to release the virions, and then this is what we call the burst. As the cells burst, right, pretty clever name, 
and then the virions are released and then at the end of that we get this plateau right as the virions get released what's going on with my pointer here uh, as the virions get released and then all right, there we go. As uh, the virions get released, and then we have this uh, this plateau, right? And this is what's called the burst size, right? The number of uh, virions from here to there divided by the number of cells indicates how many uh, virions are released per bacterium. Okay, and that's pretty much all we want to talk about viruses. Now we're going to get into like the weird stuff, right? Viruses are already pretty weird, right? Now we're going to get into the weird stuff, stuff like... Uh, these things called viroids, virusoids, and prions. And like this, this is like weird, right? Like we we talk about how you know, biology always finds a way, right? Life finds a way. Well, I mean, this is like really weird, right? Basically, they're non-living disease-causing agents like viruses, right? But they're different, right? Uh, however, just like viruses, they do require a host to be replicated, right? But the structures are so different and the fact that they're even able to survive and where do they come from? It's like really crazy stuff. Um, viroids are short strands of circular RNA. Right? Let me repeat that. They're short strands of circular RNA. And what is up with that, right? These things are capable of self-replicating, right? However, they do require host machinery, right? And there are many, um, many uh, plant viruses. Sorry, not the virus plant pathogens these viroids that uh, are capable of infecting right so like this potato one for example right it's just a short strand of circular rna that uh, infects this uh, potato causing this disease right there's no protein coat no nothing else um, they can be self-replicated but they require host machinery to do that right weird stuff i know even weirder are these things called virusoids all right, like where do, who names these things? Virusoids are non-self-replicating single-stranded RNA. So now we have these things that are capable of infecting that are single-stranded RNA, and they don't even replicate themselves. It requires this thing called a helper virus. Like what? It needs another virus for it to be able to replicate, right? So there's this hepatitis delta virusoid that requires hepatitis B virus, right? So those that are infected with hepatitis B um, sometimes get infected with hepatitis delta virusoid, and that increases the pathology of hepatitis B virus. But if you somehow acquire hepatitis delta virusoid, you're not going to get infection because it requires this hepatitis B virus in order for it to be replicated, right? So it's crazy, right? It's this infectious RNA, right? That's non-self-replicating single-stranded RNA, and that's all it is, and yet somehow it can cause this debilitating disease. Even weirder than that are these things called prions, and prions are these infectious proteins, like proteins that are infectious, right? That's crazy. Um, and what they are are these misfolded um, form of a normal protein, right? So we have a totally normal protein, and then uh, when we have this, uh, this prion, right, it now interacts with our normal protein and then undergoes this conversion and it, it causes them to become this misfolded or this mutant form of this protein. And not only does it do this, it's transmissible, right? So the most famous case of this is this transmissible spongiform encephalopathy, right, aka mad cow disease, right? In humans, it's called Creutzfeldt uh, Jakob disease. Right, where it uh, starts to take um, brain tissue, right? And then as the proteins start to interact and replicate, it then causes these lesions, these uh, sponge like lesions in the brain tissue and this degenerative neurological disorder. Right? It's crazy stuff, right? So, you know, I always thought viruses were really cool in the sense that they're really scraping the edge of what is living, what is non living. We always think life is all about figuring out a way to replicate. Well, these virusoids, um, prions, right, viroids, are they also living? Because, I mean, really, at the end of the day, what are they trying to do? They're trying to replicate themselves, and somehow they figured out how to do that, right? Anyways, mind is blown. I need to take a break. So that's it for Module 3. Um, 
if you have any questions, right? I know a lot of cool things out there. We just kind of scraped the surface of a lot of these things, right? So there's a lot more reading that you can do, right? And I encourage you to go and learn more about these uh, crazy things out there and all these different types of microbes that are not bacteria, right? Lots of interesting things out there, right? So much to learn. Um, until then, uh, we will see you in module four where we talk all about cell metabolism.